Thanks for joining us today. I hope you've got some lunch to enjoy while you listen in and hear from our regional weed coordinator, our plant biosecurity officer, and our sustainable land management team leader here at Local Land Services. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we're all today and pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Ella Rasmussen and I work with North Coast Local Land Services on a project called Every Bit Counts. I'll tell you a bit about that in a second, but um, for, for those of you who might not have been here last week, but I'm here to, today to facilitate the session and introduce our presenters. I'll just run through some quick housekeeping points. Hopefully by now you should be able to see the presentation slides moving and also be able to see a picture of myself, a box with captioning in it and a chat box as well. Just a few notes around privacy. No one else can see who else is logged in unless you write something in the chat box, in which case everyone can see. Um, if you've logged in using your name and you, would like, and you would, wouldn't like others to see your name, the best way, way around this is to log out and log back in again using a different name or you can just refrain from typing in the chat box. The webinar is being recorded. However, the recording is only of the presentation and the voices of the presenters, so there's nothing to worry about there. Everyone's microphones will have been automatically muted when you joined. So if you'd like to ask a question, please write it in the chat box and someone will respond to you. If you have a question about the topic that we're talking about, please also write that in the chat box and we'll ask the presenters to respond during or after their talk. If we run out of question time, we'll also compile any unanswered questions and email these around um, to all of the attendees. So also joining us from LLS today is Donna Cuthall, who is our Plant Biosecurity Officer, and she's going to talk about plant pests to look out for and general biosecurity practices for your property. We'll also be hearing from Kylie Vanderkolk, who is our Regional Weed Coordinator for the North Coast. She'll be giving an overview of managing weeds on your property and which weeds are a priority at the moment. And finally, we'll hear from Claire Hewitt from the Sustainable Land Management Team on how to navigate allowable activities, which can include remo uh, weed removal or fencing on small properties. There are a lot of different factors that come into play depending on where you live, so it will be great from here to hear from her as well. So some of you might have tuned in to part one of this webinar last week. Um, I provided a bit of an overview of the Every Bit Counts project and LLS, but we'll summarise that again quickly now for those joining us for the first time today. Local Land Services is a New South Wales wide organisation that runs a number of land management projects, but we also have staff available to provide advice to landholders on a number of agricultural and environmental topics. Everybody, uh, sorry, Every Bit Counts is a project that's being rolled out across the four coastal local land services regions, and it focuses on delivering information and events to small landholders. It recognises that there's a huge number of smaller farms along the New South Wales coast and that people on those properties might not have the same access to, the, to resources or advice that larger properties might have. Um, these smaller properties are often in amongst urban blocks and larger producing farms and it's that reason that connectivity through these properties is so important and why biosecurity is so important regardless of property size. The project has a new website which houses useful resources and this link will take you to that. There's also a newsletter which you may have ticked the subscription box for when you signed up to this webinar and um, that provides information on resources, um, news and events that might be relevant to your small property. Thanks for listening and thanks for being here today. Um, please ask lots of questions in the chat box as we go along. I'm going to hand over to Donna now. Um, Donna's been working for local land services since 2018 as a plant biosecurity officer. Prior to that, she spent the previous 20 years in Bundaberg working for the Department of Primary Industries and Fisheries, where she worked in the areas of ag extension, plant biosecurity and emergency management. I'll just change the presentation over now and then it's over to you, Donna. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So today I'm gonna to be chatting to you about biosecurity. It's a topic I became super interested in after spending two months working on the Panama disease outbreak in Bananas in Tully. My time there highlighted um, to me the devastating impact that exotic pests and diseases can have on our people and in our communities. 
So the following presentation is a snapshot of why biosecurity is so important. Uh, in the beginning, I'll take you through some simple things that you can do to monitor your environment, and then we'll have a look at a couple of pests that are knocking on our door so that you can help to keep an eye out for those as well. So what does biosecurity mean and why do we care? Uh, biosecurity is the protecting of the economy, environment and community from the negative impacts of pests, diseases, weeds and contaminants. Poor biosecurity practices can allow diseases to enter a property and spread, resulting in the loss of money and reputation for you as a landholder, as well as potentially spreading to neighbours, clients or at worst, the whole of the country. So you, are, as owners of small land holdings, play a really important part in keeping Australia's agricultural industries free from the impacts of these devastating pests and diseases. And by practising good biosecurity, you're taking action to not only protect your own hobby farm or small landholders from the above negative impacts, but also from um, passing those on to your next door neighbours. So why is it a good thing uh, to be having these good biosecurity practices? So it can help keep your animals safe from disease. It can help you grow more produce and reduce the impacts of pests and diseases and weeds on your property. And it also helps to our primary producers to gain better yields at lower costs, whilst also maintaining access to interstate and international markets. That's really important to them. How can you help? So there's everyday farming and gardening practices that are all part of being biosecure. And some of these practices can include preventing the spread of pests and diseases by checking materials and machinery when they enter and leave your property for unwanted hitchhikers, that whole come clean, go clean thing. So, and you know, by making, oh sorry, I missed my page. Um, and this can be achieved by looking for things like weed seeds hiding or mud which could um, contain soil diseases. It can be also by checking feed out areas for signs of unusual insect infestations or weeds. And this is particularly important coming off one of the back of the devastating fires that we've had recently. It was necessary to source feed for hungry stock from all over Australia. So it's really important that if you received any of this fodder, you check your feed out areas for signs of any of these unwanted pests. It can also be educating visitors to your property on the importance of biosecurity and the practices that you might have implemented on your place, or as having an emergency disease action plan or farm biosecurity plan. And if this is something that you are interested in, there are a number of proformers out there that can help. And feel free to give me a call and we can discuss the most appropriate one for your enterprise. So this is one I guess that comes up for me quite a bit when I'm chatting to people. It's that there are a lot of pests, so there are a lot of insects out there and picking up on something that un that's unusual can be really hard. So it's really I guess a matter of you finding out for yourself what's normal or what's unusual in your own environment. So to do this you can make observations throughout the year and learn what is normal and perhaps not normal for that particular season. You know, are your plants or produce showing damage that you wouldn't usually see, or are you finding larvae that you haven't seen before? And as we move on, there'll be a thing called fall armyworm, and it's very important that that actually comes into play there. You can get familiar with knowledge sources where you can find out more about common garden pests for your area. And you can also do your own monitoring or surveillance with sticky traps, shelter traps, or fit, sorry, fitful traps to get a better understanding of what is present in your own environment. So this next slide is about a thing called your general biosecurity duty. So there are certain actions a small uh, landholder or hobby farmer must legally take to be biosecure. These are detailed in the Biosecurity Act 2015 and its supporting leg legislation. The laws cover things that are likely to have the biggest impact on our community environment and they uh, include rules around high risk and priority pests and diseases that must be reported. These things are also known as notifiable pests and diseases, prohibited matter and biosecurity events. They also um, are rules that are surrounding controlling the movement, treatment and importation of plants and having the right accreditations, registration, certificates and permits appropriate to your business or land holding. So that's really only would be appropriate for, for you guys if you're carrying on some sort of um, business at your place or a commercial enterprise. 
Right, this brings us on to the two pests that I mentioned a little bit earlier that are currently in Queensland and ones that we really don't want in New South Wales. So the first one's ready ported fire ant and if Mindy and I can get the technology to work, I've got a quick video to show you that uh, was produced by the Fire Ant Control Centre and the good part of it is it'll save you having to listen to me for the next two minutes. So if we can play that one Mindy, that'd be great. Fire ants are an invasive ant species. Uh, they come from the Pantanal region in South America and they're really good hitchhikers. So they made their way to the US probably in the 1930s in ships ballast and from there they've spread out to 17 states in the US affecting something like 70 million people. They've also spread to China, to Taiwan and also to the Caribbean. And in 2001 we found them in Brisbane in Australia. They're a super pest. They'll affect human health and lifestyle, they'll eat our crops, they'll sting our livestock, they'll damage our infrastructure, they'll reduce biodiversity. They're going to cost our economy. In the United States, the damage there is about $7 billion a year. If you're looking for fire ants in a residential block, you'd probably find them on lawns, garden beds, on footpaths, you'd find them near taps, and you'd find them in utility pits. If you're in rural areas, then you would tend to look for them alongside dams or irrigation lines. You'd find them under fence lines, on the edges of crop land, sometimes in crop land, and in piles of organic matter such as hay or mulch. Appearance, they're coppery brown in colour, they have a darker abdomen and they range in sizes from about two millimetres to six millimetres. The nest itself is usually a mound and the thing that makes their mounds a little bit different to native ants is that they've got no entrance or exit holes. The first thing to remember is that fire ants are dangerous. They can hospitalise you, they can kill you. So don't go poking a fire ant's nest with your finger or attempt to kick it with your foot uh, because they'll run out very, very quickly and start to sting. It's probably best to just poke them gently with a stick and observe what happens. So as you can see from that one, I didn't stop it in time. So um, I'll give you the contact information if you think that you might have fire ants a little bit further down the track. So the next one's fall armyworm. And this is one that's taken up quite an amount of my time sort of since about March of this year. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, fall armyworm is a new plant pest present in Queensland, but thankfully we've not yet found it in New South Wales. The insect has a host range of some um, 350 plant species and is a serious threat to our Australian grain, rice, cotton, horticultural and sugar industries. Although at the moment um, I was chatting to um, one of our guys from um, Queensland uh, only a couple of days ago and at this point in time it's not looking like it's having too much effect on the cane industry, um, but the potential is unfortunately still there. So fall armyworm damage in many crops has similar symptoms to that caused by other larvae and I've found a lot of that in doing the monitoring of mostly maize. Um, we have another thing that's actually currently in, in New South Wales, it's called false armyworm and the damage looks very similar so it's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, adult fall armyworm moths are strong flyers and will travel hundreds of kilometres on storm fronts. So at the moment, it's been, the furthest south it's been found is at Bundaberg, um, but given that Bundaberg is only about 500 kilometres um, from our New South Wales border, there's every chance that um, either in this coming season or the following season, we might see it turn up in our traps. So if you're needing a little bit more information, sort of either detailed information sort of on the identification or establishment of fall armyworm, there's been uh, two webinars that we've completed and both of those webinars um, are able to be accessed via that YouTube site and I think Mindy yep, um, has put that into our chat section. Um, so I'd really encourage you to go and have a listen and, and have a look at those if you want a little bit more information on that. Otherwise, feel free to contact me. I'd be more than happy to to discuss it with you.
So what happens if you do think that you have either an exotic or red imported fire ants or fall army worm? There's a few different ways you can actually um, let somebody know. The first one is to call the exotic plant pest hotline. You can email biosecurity at DPI with a clear photo and your contact details. And that one's actually quite important um, with the fall army worm. Um, identification because if you can get a clear photo of the larvae, they can pretty much identify it sort of on the spot straight away. The moths are, are a bit of a more of a process, but certainly larvae seem to be um, a lot more easy to identify. Uh, there's an online form um, or you can contact myself or somebody at your local land services office on that number. Um, and we can sort of talk to you through, you know, what you might have. Um, if you happen to be close to me, I can always come and have a look at it or do a sample for you and send it away. So this kind of brings us to my final slide, which is, I guess, my take home message for you. And that is that biosecurity is everybody's business. And we all have a role to play in protecting New South Wales from exotic plant pests and diseases. So what you'll see on that last slide um, is a picture of our farm biosecurity signs um, that can go on your gate. And we do have those available through local land services. So if you want to contact myself or Ella or one of the officers, um, we'll do our best to get one to you. But uh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks for sharing that with us, Donna. That was wonderful and very informative. Um, if anyone's got any questions, just pop them in the chat box and um, we can ask Donna on your behalf. Um, I do have a question that's come through from someone who wasn't able to attend today. Um, they were asking about the biosecurity plans and whether there are any size restrictions on your property for needing, needing to have one in place. Uh, so it's not really about a size restriction, it's just about having those plans in place if something does actually turn up on your property. However, if you're going to, the new legislation is that if you're going to have one of those um, farm gate signs, then part of that process is that you need to have a working biosecurity plan. Um, the legal aspects surrounding that. So I guess it's a, a bit of a two thing. If you've got a carrying on a sort of a, a horticultural enterprise and you need protection from this from this sign, then you're going to need to have um, that farm biosecurity plan in place. But otherwise, it's just generally like a really good idea, even if it's not a you know a, a huge document. Just uh, um, if you, if you've got a land holding or you know some sort of a small area um, hobby farm, it's really good just to have those um, key practices in place and know where to go and know what to do if something does turn up on your property. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Thanks for that again, Donna. We'll now hear from Kylie van der Kolk and I'll just change the presentation over. Uh, Kylie is our North Coast Regional Weed Coordinator. She's worked for local land services for the past two years and before that she worked at Ralph County Council as a weed officer and at National Parks and Wildlife in the Northern Rivers. She has a Bachelor of Environmental Science and a certificate, in, a certificate Three in Natural Area Restoration. In her own time, she enjoys horse riding and controlling weeds on her own small adjustment paddock on the coast. Over to you, Kylie. Great, thanks for the introduction, Ella. It's great to be here. So as Ella said, my name's Kylie. I'm the Regional Weed Coordinator. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about weed biosecurity. So the first thing I'll start off with is saying that everyone has weeds. <laughs> uh, whether you have a large farm or you know just a rural, uh, sorry, an urban lot, pretty much everyone has weeds in one way or another. Uh, and I know that it can be overwhelming, uh, you know, to get on top of your weeds. And we also have a wide variety of plants here on the north coast. New, uh, the north coast region of New South Wales is the most biodiverse region uh, in New South Wales. So not only does that mean that we have lots of great, beautiful, endemic, local native plants, it also means that we have a wide variety of weeds that can grow here. And finally, because everyone has weeds, and there are so many, it's really easy to find excuses not to do anything about it. I understand that it can be a bit overwhelming, but we're going to um, try and prioritise things for you a bit today. So if everyone has weeds, you're probably thinking, well, why bother? And the reason is because, uh, you know, weeds, can impact on our agricultural industry, they can impact on wildlife, they can impact on the native habitats of those wildlife, they can impact on our scenery, our recreational uses such as boating and fishing, uh, they can reduce the value of the, your land, some weeds can impact on human health and, and others on animal health. 
But finally, there's also some weeds where you actually have a legal responsibility to control those. So I'm going to break it down into a few steps to try and make it a little bit easier for you for, e for how to approach weed management. And of course, there's many different ways. This is just what I would suggest. So the first thing would be to have a look at your property. Whether you have an urban lot or you have a 100 acre farm, just go for a wander around uh, or a drive around and have a look at what you've already got there. And, and this ties in with what Donna was saying, you know, look at what bugs you've got, look at what weeds you've got, look at what native plants you might have. Then from there, try to, try to start identifying a few. Now as I said, we do have lots, so it can be a bit overwhelming at the start. But just start off with one or two plants, you know, and then you can build from there. Maybe if you, if you learn a new plant a week or a month, um, you know, eventually you'll, you'll start to realise that, hey, I actually know quite a lot of weeds now. So once you know what you have, then you should prioritise them for control. So we'll go into that a lot more throughout the presentation, but um, basically just make a bit of a, a game plan so that you don't get overwhelmed. Weed control requires ongoing maintenance to be effective, so uh, you know, you can't just go in there and think that you'll clean everything up in one day and, and your job's done, you never have to do it again. And so the next thing, the next step is once you've prioritised, you do your control and then repeat the process. And when I say repeat the process, that's, that's repeating the control but also repeating the looking. So after you've done, perhaps it might even be the first time that you've gone around and specifically looking at plants, go around again in, you know, on a regular basis, maybe once every three months and say, hey, is that a new plant? That's a fruit I haven't seen before. Or that's a flower I haven't seen before. And that will help you to uh, figure out if you have new weeds. So the reason why that's important uh, is because prevention is really a quite effective way of managing weeds. I often use the analogy that imagine if someone identified the first fireweed and thought, hold on a minute, that looks like it could spread over the entire north coast. I might pull out these six plants now and save myself and everyone else a lot of time and money in the future. So this curve here demonstrates that basically. Uh, so obviously where you have a small number of, of, of weeds or uh, plant pests in Donna's case, it's easiest and most cost effective to get rid of them when you only have a few compared to when you have a lot. And so this is the way that we prioritise weeds in the region. Uh, weeds that don't occur here, um, but we know have uh, the potential to have a significant impact. We focus our efforts, uh, our efforts there because we find that we'll get the best return on investment. Where you have more widespread weeds, uh, we take more of an asset-based protection for those. So we might control them to protect um, a threatened ecological community or something like that, um, you know, focusing on protecting that actual asset rather than um, eradicating them from the entire region. So basically, prevention saves you money and this is the most cost effective way to minimise um, you know, the impact of weeds. And that is why we uh, usually target high risk weeds rather than widespread weeds. So going back to the prioritisation, um, the good thing is we've sort of done that for you. So what we have is a regional strategic weed management plan and this, this plan was developed by the Regional Weed Committee which has members from all of the local councils, from uh, land care, from national parks, forestry, crown lands and local land services and DPI. So um, basically what we do is we assess all of the weeds um, that either occur here or are likely to occur here. Uh, you know, some of them may be in Queensland and haven't got here yet. Some of them might be um, in another region close by as in the Northern Tablelands or something like that. So what we do is we take a look at those plants and we assess the risk that they could pose to our region and we consider how invasive they are, the potential impact, the potential distribution, the cost of coordinated control, the weed's ability to persist in the environment, in other words if it's really hard to control, and its current distribution. And once we do that we basically uh, rank them in order of priority. And so the highest priority ones are prohibitive matter or prevention priority species through to eradication, containment and asset protection. And so the regional plan, if you go straight to the back of the plan, it lists all the weeds, what, what management category they are and it clearly defines how you can uphold your general biosecurity duty that Donna touched on. So the only issue with this plan is 
it doesn't actually tell you, it doesn't have pictures, right? <laughs> um, so if you go to the back of the plan, you'll just see a list. You then need to download the New South Wales Weedwise app, and it's a free app, and it has over 300 weed profiles. So not only does it have majority of the weeds that are in our plan, it certainly has all the priority ones. Um, it also has other weeds. So if you have your plan, uh, and then you go to, you can type the name into the Weedwise, then you can, you, there's pictures and a description of the plant, tells you how to control it, um, and also the biosecurity duty is, is mentioned in there as well. So that links directly with the regional plan and directly with the Biosecurity Act. So really, it's all of that information. You don't have to go read legislation. You can refer to the app. So I'd like to really encourage you guys to download the, the New South Wales Weedwise app right now. And if you do have the time to do it, it's free, as I said. Um, Mindy might be able to put the link in the chat. And then what I'm going to do is a quick little quiz. And if you can, if you can answer the questions of the quiz, we'll send you a free T-shirt. So I'll just jump onto the next slide. And uh, when you think you have the answer, please put it into the chat. And then the first person to correctly answer that question We'll get in touch with you and we'll get your postal address so that we can send you a t-shirt. So the first one would be, uh, when you open the app, there's a list of weeds and they're all in alphabetical order. So what is the eighth weed on the list? The second question is, there's a search bar on the app. So what happens when you type in the word long? What's the first weed that comes up? And I can see we've already got a winner here for the first question. The second, uh, sorry, the third question is, how many pictures of Camp for Laurel are there on the app? So when you open the app, you can see there's a big picture at the top and you can slide across and there's different pictures of the weed. So how many is there of Camp for Laurel? I'll move on, but feel free to keep entering, um, entering your responses in there and, and as I said, we'll get in touch. So the next part of the presentation, I'm just going to run you through some of the weeds that you might um, encounter. And it's, these can be either the first three weeds that you learn or maybe they're, they're just adding to the long list of plants you already know. So the first one is Amazon frogbit. And this one's a floating aquatic weed. Uh, you'll notice that, or you'll be able to identify it most easily because A, it's floating in the water, but B, it also has a little air sac on the underside of the leaf. Um, there is a native plant that also has little air sacs under the leaf. So if you think you have seen this weed, the best thing to do is to call your local council weed officer. They'll come out for free and they will identify or confirm the identification for you. This one's a prohibitive matter species, so it's highly significant across the state. Where to look for it? So check your waterways, check any dams you might have on your property, um, any creeks. Also check your fish pond. Um, <laughs> so this one actually can be spread by people uh, selling it online. So um, we know that it's going to have a serious impact on waterways in our region, but it's not a prohibited plant everywhere in Australia. So make sure that you don't buy this online, and if you have, call your weed officer and they'll help you remove and dispose of it responsibly. The next one is Parthenium weed, and this one's an issue because it can cause um, respiratory issues and skin and issues with your skin. It also can um, taint the meat and milk of, um, of cattle and it can cause um, you know, health issues for those animals as well. The main difference or the way to identify this one is it looks a lot like annual ragweed, but as you can see, the stems um, are quite grooved or ribbed. So that's, um, that's a good way to identify it. We'd encourage you to wear gloves though if you're going to get that close to it so that you don't get that, that dermatitis impact. The place to look for this is, uh, like Donna said, in feed out areas. This plant's currently in Queensland, so any feed that came down from there could potentially have parthenium in it. Um, also check around food, uh, chicken coops, along road edges, or any disturbed areas or bare soil. And so uh, it looks like we have had an incursion of this in our region recently in Nambucca Shire and, and on the edge of Ballingen Shire as well. Um, and we suspect that it was uh, brought in by chicken feed. So coarse organic chicken feed, if you have chooks, uh, have, keep an eye out. You don't want your little ones uh, getting irritated skin from this one. The, the third and final uh, weed that I'm going to introduce you to today is tropical soda apple. 
this one um, you can clearly identify it from other um, Solanum species. It has a clear vein down the centre of the leaf and quite large leaves. It also has um, golf ball sized fruit that start off green and they look like little watermelons and then they go to yellow. So there's a picture of the fruit there. The places to look for these are stockyards, cattle camps, again feed out areas in case they've been cut up in hay. Along waterways those little fruit will float and along roadsides in case someone's uh, got some seeds stuck to their tyre. The main thing is, the main vector for spread though with these ones is actually cows because they eat the fruit and um, then they, they spread them from one area to another. So if you are getting new stock you can hold them in holding paddocks for seven days. Um, so then if you do get this weed you've only got a small holding paddock to manage it in compared to your whole property. So to get started this weekend, go for a walk and look at the plants on your place. Weeding is just like mowing the lawn and doing the washing. It's just one of those jobs you need to do when you own a small farm, you know, a peri-urban farm, a hundred acre farm or even, you know, a residential block. Um, and the other thing I would suggest is, you know, because we know it's an ongoing, ongoing job, just set a reminder on your phone or, or set a time, you know, once a month or once every three months. Just, just set a reminder that, hey, I should go out and do the weed control again. And if you do um, get stuck on which plants you might have on your place, uh, you can always contact your local council weed officers. They can come out to your property and for free and look at the weeds that you have and tell you how to control them. So it's a really great service. Um, if you're interested in finding out who your weed officers are, just get in touch with us. Um, otherwise, yeah, most of your general purpose councils have one unless you live um, in Tweed, Byron, Ballina, Richmond Valley, Kyogle and Leafmore Shire, then you're covered by Rouse County Council which is, they're, they're sort of specialised in weed biosecurity. You can also contact myself, Landcare, uh, you know, they're active contributors to our regional weed committee and, and they've been working a lot in the biosecurity space recently so they, they'll be able to help you as well. And like all chores, if you don't want to mow the lawn or do the washing yourself, you could always just engage a bush regen or weed control contractor. You know, if it's all a bit too hard, that's obviously another option. Uh, and finally, if you think you have found specifically any three of those weeds that I've suggested today, um, or any weeds that you, that you notice as prevention categories in the regional plan or when you go to your WeedWise app, if they're, if they're a prohibitive matter species or a weed control order species, uh, contact the biosecurity helpline and, and they'll, um, they'll relay the message basically to all of the above. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, thanks, Ella. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that with us, Harley, and well done to those who answered the quiz question. Um, we have got a couple of questions that have come through. Um, Andrew asked about soil fertility in relation to weeds. Um, does knowing soil fertility and the acidity have anything to do with um, with controlling controlling the weeds that might be on your property, or not knowing more about them? Oh, that's a tricky question. And in terms of control, I actually don't know the answer. So I might have to get back to Andrew about that one. I know that certainly um, certain weeds will grow better or worse on on certain pH acidities, but I don't know whether that impacts so much on the control. Just as a guess, I would assume that if um, the plant is already stressed and growing on an undesirable pH, it may be less likely to take up herbicides, but really that's a stab in the dark. <laughs> so I'll do a bit of research and, and get a bit more information to you, Andrew. Um, it, but if you did want to look at um, the soil fertility and suitable soils for weeds, there's a really great website called Weed Futures. And so that looks at, um, there's profiles on there as well that are a little bit more scientific and it tells you what pH those soils will grow on and also interestingly how they're likely to respond under a changing climate. So great question. Another question, how can I get a hold of the, the North Coast Weed Priority Booklet? Uh, sure. Well, you can contact local land services and I'll be able to post you out a copy of that. So that's fine, Melanie. Um, we, can, we can grab your details and, and email that to you. Oh, sorry, send that out to you. Um, there's also an online version. So if you don't necessarily need the hard copy, um, you can get 
the online version from the North Coast Local Land Services webpage. Um, would you be able to explain the different levels of orders? Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose that refers back to my, my slide with the, with the chart there. So there's weeds that we're trying to prevent from establishing. And, and so those ones are commonly, we, you know, in the weed booklet, they, they're re recorded as prevention priority weeds. We don't want them to come here. They don't currently occur, and if they do, we're going to get onto them straight away. Um, so those actually, there's regional prevention priority weeds, as in ones that the Regional Weed Committee have identified, and then there's state priority weeds. So that means anywhere in New South Wales, they're prevention priority weeds, and those are referred to as prohibitive matter. So it's a little bit, a little bit of a crossover there, but in the plan it just says prevent. And then when you get to eradicate, so those weeds occur here, but they only occur to a limited extent. And um, we think that eradication is still possible based on you know, the number of infestations that we have. So again, there's regional eradication ones, ones that the Regional Weed Committee have determined. You know, and that's also, you know, all the weeds that we have at a regional level are also uh, checked by the DPI as well. Um, and then, sorry, the Department of Primary Industries, for those who don't know that one. And then within, sitting within that, there's, um, again, state-listed weed control order weeds. And, and they're still eradication priority, but again, they need to be eradicated everywhere in the state, not just specific to the climatic conditions of our region. So tropical soda apple is an example of that. The next one are containment priority weeds, and these are in order of priority. So they're sort of the third priority, if you like, containment priority weeds. Again, they haven't spread to the full distribution that they, they could, um, but, but we know that they can spread further, basically. So, so by containing those to certain areas, getting them before they produce seeds and, and so that they don't spread to your neighbours or to other local government areas, that's sort of the aim for those ones. And then the fourth category is asset protection, where you're looking at protecting a particular asset from the impact of those weeds. So the example I mentioned at the start of the presentation was a threatened ecological community. So if you've got rare and threatened plants there and weeds are going to impact on them, and we know that they do because they're listed as a key threatening process um, under the Biodiversity Conservation Act, um, then then we remove those weeds in order to maintain that habitat for those threatened plants or animals. Um, another question has come through. What if you don't want to chemically control your weeds? Oh, that's fine. Yeah, but you can control weeds in any way that you wish. So you'll see on WeedWise that there are non-chemical control methods as well. Um, you can either dig them out, you know, you can, you can just continuously cut them down. Um, there's also biological control agents available for some weeds. And so currently we have biological control agents available for Salvinia, uh, Madeira vine and cat's claw creeper. There's also um, a biological control task force operating in New South Wales to bring, bring more biocontrols available for New, for New South Wales and, and also to um, support the rearing of those. So there's a facility down in Grafton that does that. But once again, contact your local council weed officer because they can um, get them for you and bring them to you for free. So really it doesn't matter how you control them, you know. If it's a containment priority weed and you just want to keep slashing it so that it doesn't ever seed, then that's, that's fine as well. Um, it's, it's really up to you. Another question from Melanie. Um, she said, I'm interested in pasture improvements to help control the weeds as well. So I'm thinking soil testing would be a first port of call. Are there people available to help point me in the right direction with this? Yeah, definitely. So that one, Melanie, I would suggest um, calling our local land services office. So we have a sustainable agriculture team who are really across pasture improvement and management. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but soil testing I think is certainly something that they would recommend. The other thing is that I do in my own paddock is just making sure that there's no bare, bare soil. So you might want to do um, things like rotational grazing so that you can you can rest a paddock and, and let the grass, the grass come back up and occupy those bare spaces 
while they're grazing another section because obviously if you create those openings then the first thing that sort of takes advantage of that is the weeds. So if you can keep a good a good cover um, then that's a good start. Well that, that's what I do anyway but uh, give us a call at the um, and oh yeah but Mindy's just put the number in and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to put you through to one of the sustainable agriculture um, people and they'll be able to provide a lot more information about that, even about reseeding again to reduce that those gaps in your pasture. Thanks again, Kylie. Um, we're now going to hear from Claire Hewitt. I'll just change presentations over to Claire. Actually, before we start, we've just had one more question um, come in from Col from Colin. Are native grasses good for animals and weed control, Kylie? Good for animals and weed control. Hmm. I'm not sure what their um, grazing value is. Uh, the Department of Primary Industries has a pretty good website where they list all the pasture species and um, you know how valuable they are for grazing. Again, that would probably be something to talk about our sustainable agriculture people about. Um, and in terms of um, weed suppressing weeds. Absolutely. If you have something that's already occupying that space and it's a native grass or a native ground cover, then that's amazing. That means that you're not going to get, you're not creating the opportunity for weeds there and better yet, you've got a beautiful native species instead. So I hope that answers the question. Wonderful. Thanks, Kylie. Yeah, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to jot them down in the chat box and we can, um, we can provide an answer. After the webinar, we can compile any unanswered questions and send them out to you guys. Um, so moving on to Claire now. Claire's been working for local land services since 2014. She started in the Hunter Local Land Services region as an education officer before moving to project management up here in the North Coast area. For the last three years, she's been working in the land management space, advising landholders on vegetation management. Claire emigrated from Scotland in 2012 and has loved learning about Australian agricultural and ecological systems ever since. Over to you, Claire. Thanks, Ella, and good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to be here as well. Um, yes, as Ella said, I'm responsible for the team that advises on vegetation management under what's called Part 5A of the Local Land Services, is it Local Land Services Act which is predominantly on rural land um, and we provide clearing approvals where appropriate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about managing exotic and non-native vegetation, including weeds, in the context of some other legislative requirements. Um, but I must stress it's important to manage your weed, as Kylie discussed, um, but how you do it and for what purpose um, may be restricted in some circumstances. So for context, um, my presentation applies to rural land, so that's land zoned RU1 to RU4 and also RU6, deferred matter areas which occur in some coastal zones and there's possible limitations there. Um, and in some local council areas, E zones and R5 zones only if agriculture is, pre is present. So just to give you, provide you some tools, so in order to determine your zoning, you can look up what's called the planning portal. Um, that can tell you what zoning is on your property. Um, you can look up your lot and DP number on your rates notice, and it's obviously important to know your local government area. And another tool that you're going to find useful for the context of my presentation is what's called the Native Vegetation Regulatory Map. And there's the link there, which Mindy's just provided in the chat. So this shows land categories on properties, and it determines the land categories under what's called the Land Management Framework. And this is a combination of Part 5A of the Local Land Services Act, the Biodiversity Conservation Act, and the State Environmental Protection Policy for Vegetation in Non-Rural Areas 2017. So the map's public and you can look up your property on the map. So, so just going back to that slide, so on the map there's various categories of land. One's called Vulnerable Regulated Land and it's orange. 
One's called sensitive regulated land, and it's pink. One's called excluded land, and it's gray. It doesn't show what's called Category 1 exempt land. That's land exempt from the Local Land Services Act, and just plain old Category 2 regulated land. And that's where local land services can assist. So if you follow the link, you get to this page. Um, you can use the blue Start Here button up in the top left corner to search for your lot and DP. Um, down in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a Home button, and then there's a Layers button beside it. You can press on the Layers button to look at what the layer category colors mean. Um, and in the top right corner, there's some tools you can use to find out a little bit more information. Um, for example, you can use the Identify tool to look at lot size. Um, you can use the measurement tool as well. And I've just put um, a zoomed in, in image of the native vegetation regulatory map here, which shows the Ballina area. So you can see here there's areas of grey, and that's land that's excluded from the Local Land Services Act. And in this case, it's non-rural land, and it would be vegetation management be regulated by Ballina Shire Council. Um, the orange map land is vulnerable land, and in this case, it's the Richmond River. And this is land that's prone to erosion because it's either riverbank or riparian land or it's steep, and therefore removal of any vegetation in this case is um, might cause issues, including weeds. And the land that's pink is sensitive regulated land, and it's got high conservation value. Um, for example, it might be mapped core koala habitat, and there's restrictions on vegetation management in these areas too. So the area of orange is the area I'm focusing on today, um, because in these areas, weeds are counted as native vegetation because of the risk of erosion from their removal. However, it is still too important, it's still important to control those weeds but how you do it um, is important, and the purpose of its removal. So we have what's called allowable activities. And allowable activities enable this um, weed management in those orange areas, the vulnerable land. Um, allowable activities are divided up into zones, depending where you are. Um, the green zone is the coastal zone. The orange zone is the central zone. and the dark orange area is the western zone, and allowable activities change depending where you are in the landscape. But vulnerable land, the orange land on the native vegetation regulatory map, occurs all over the landscape. So allowable activities, these are activities that are permitted without formal approval under the Local Land Services Act. and. Um, don't uh, require gen uh, development consent by council, though it is always worth checking. And they're restricted on the Category 2 vulnerable regulated land and the Category 2 sensitive regulated land because of the risk of erosion from their removal and other conservation risks. But this allowable activity that I've listed at the top here of environmental protection works, that covers your weed removal on Category 2 vulnerable regulated land. And environmental protection works is um, for the purpose of rehabilitating the land back to its natural state um, and undertaking the works with minimizing the risk of soil erosion. I've listed some examples there of other allowable activities as well, um, such as removing vegetation that's posing an imminent risk to personal property, removing vegetation that's planted. Um, removing vegetation for construction timber and firewood, though there are some quite strict restrictions on that. Um, public works, gravel pits, power lines, communications, infrastructure and airstrips, again, there's restrictions there. For sustainable grazing and clearing for rural infrastructure, that would include allowable activities for fence lines, tracks, um, dams, sheds, and the like. It's always worth consulting with local land services over the allowable activities just to determine any specific restrictions on your property. 
So back to Category 2 Vulnerable and Regulated Land, which was orange on the native vegetation regulatory map. As I mentioned, non-native vegetation is considered native on Category 2 Vulnerable Regulated Land, but we still have our biosecurity duty under the Biosecurity Act 2015. Um, and then there's restrictions under Part 5A of the Local Land Services Act. But the way around this is to use environmental protection works, i.e. doing your weed control with the purpose of rehabilitating the land back to its natural state um, and with minimal soil disturbance. What I mean by that is, for example, if there's a riverbank area, um, it might have once been rainforest, um, you can do your weed control with the purpose of rehabilitating that area back to rainforest, not, for example, the purpose of putting a, a crop in place. That wouldn't be rehabilitation. So in some circumstances, development approval might be required, but local land services can advise you on that, and then you would need to speak to your local council area. So back to environmental protection works, just again, environmental protection works means works associated with the rehabilitation of land back to its natural state, and it doesn't apply to land under a private native forestry plan. Just some other considerations, other legal considerations, and again, the legislation is very complicated. Um, local land services are here to help you navigate through the different legislative considerations um, in line with council as well. There's just a few of um, other acts that might impact upon vegetation management, including weeds in some circumstances. So it's always worth talking to ourselves or your local council just if, it's, if you're a bit worried um, or you want some clarification. Um, I've done a little disclaimer at the bottom there. It's always the landholder's responsibility to obtain any other approvals that may be required prior to undertaking clearing. That you wouldn't normally need approval to undertake weed management, but there are limited circumstances where it might apply. So again, always worth speaking to local land services or your local council. I've just done a little example here. Um, uh, just to maybe clarify a few of the things I've said. So this image I've taken from the planning portal, which I referred to at the beginning of my presentation, and this shows you your zoning on your property. So the yellow lines there, dotted lines, are the property that I've looked up. Um, and you can see in the property that there's a area of beige, which is RU2, that's rural land, rural landscape it is, and then there's the area of white, which is deferred matter um, areas. And on the deferred matter area, there may be an underlying zone on the council's previous local environment plan that might um, mean some additional restrictions. Um, so. In this case, if this were your property, I would be consulting with local land services and possibly the local council. Just moving forward, here's the same property, but on the native vegetation regulatory map. You can see that running through the property is this area of orange, and um, that's the category two vulnerable regulated land. Um, in this case, because it's a river and a river bank. And the areas that have not got color on them are probably what's called category two regulated land because there's wooded vegetation on it, woody vegetation. And then there's a small area of pink, which is the category two sensitive regulated land. And it may be, for example, core koala habitat. There's some high conservation value there. So in this instance, if I had, if this was my property and there was a large infestation of camphor laurel on the riverbank that I wanted to control, um, my first step would probably be to contact local land services um, to find out a bit, little bit more information. Now, we would advise that yes, you can control that camphor laurel, but the manner in which you do it would need to be to minimize the risk of soil erosion. Therefore, we would suggest either stem injection with the appropriate herbicide, or if you didn't want to use chemical methods, possibly chainsaw by hand to individual trees, not taking the root ball out of the riverbank. 
Um, you'd be using the allowable activity of environmental protection works. Therefore, you're rehabilitating the land back to its natural state. So you'd be trying to possibly develop rainforest here by maybe doing some supplementary planting or native regen, natural regeneration. Um, you wouldn't be clearing the camphor in order to put in, say, a crop of bananas, for example. Um, in this area, this is actually in Byron Shire. It's possible Byron Shire may need some uh, development approval if you're planning to remove camphor laurel at scale. Um, so local land services would advise that you consult with your local council, in this case Byron, for a bit more information and determine whether development approval might be required. Um, you may also want to determine whether there's threatened species present, um, particularly uh, threatened animals using the vegetation, even, even the camphor laurels, um, because you wouldn't want to wish to harm a threatened species. So local land services will be able to provide you with more advice there as well in how to protect those species. Um, so you can see there's a few matters going on. So therefore, we always suggest that you speak to local land services or your local council, because we can help you navigate through the complexities of the legislation and provide you with support. So I've provided there the number to contact. That's the general local land services number. You can ask to speak to somebody in land management. My name's Claire Hewitt. You can ask to speak to me. Um, and then I've also included a link there um, to fact sheets which detail more information about Part 5A of the Local Land Services Act, including allowable activities. So thank you very much. It sounds like it can be quite complex to, to interpret depending on where your property is. Um, if anyone has any last questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, Claire, I noticed you mentioned you can contact Council or LLS, and I know it's a question we get asked quite a lot. Is there any way of knowing who you should call first? Like, who, whether, is LLS generally the first port of call for landholders? Yeah, thanks, Ella. It's a good question. It really depends on the purpose of your clearing. That would be my first question, first point I would pose to myself. Um, so, if the purpose of your clearing is something that's going to require development consent even if you are on rural land, then you would contact your local council. Now, if the purpose of your clearing or your vegetation management, doesn't need to be clearing, is for agricultural purposes, then I would contact local land services. But either way, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the council or the local land services would know who would be the best to advise you and would refer you accordingly. all we have time for today. I think we got through most of the questions, but if there are any unanswered ones, we'll definitely respond to these and send them out to the whole group. Um, the webinar has been recorded and the recording will be made available shortly. I know there's been a couple of some sound issues today, so we'll make sure that they're all fixed out up before we um, finalise that recording and send it out to you in an email. Um, there was a lot of important information to get through, so hopefully Having that video will make it easy for you to revisit a certain topic um, if you're interested. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any further questions, just email myself or one of the presenters here today and we can get you your answers that you're looking for. Thanks, everyone.